Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody once again for program number four this afternoon. And, uh, oh, we had a lot of good food back there, didn't we? <laughs> good afternoon. Okay, for those of you joining us on television, again, we're just an informal Bible study, and uh, we just like to teach verse by verse most of the time, comparing Scripture with Scripture. And uh, we appreciate so much that you let us know how much you're learning. My, I've said it before and I guess I can say it again, the average letter says I've learned more in the last six months than I did the previous 40 years. And uh, it is, it's just encouraging to us that uh, the Lord is opening a lot of eyes to these things that are plain as day. I don't think it's all that difficult to see if they'll just look at it. All right, we're gonna pick up where we left off, Isaiah 61, and now we're down to verse six. And uh, this is an interesting situation now where the prophet writes, you shall be named, shall be now, they aren't yet, but they will be, you shall be named the priests of the Lord or of Jehovah. Priests. All right, where do you first get that? Well, come all the way back with me to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19. See, and this is the beauty of Scripture. It all fits. <clears throat> Exodus 19, and uh, just for sake of time, let's go all the way back to verse 3. Exodus 19, verse 3. Now remember the setting. Israel has just come out of Egypt. They've come through the Red Sea. They're gathered at Mount Sinai, and Moses has now gone up unto God. Okay, verse 3 of Exodus 19, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, Thus shall you tell the children of Israel. Now here it comes. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, that is, drowned them in the Red Sea, and how I bear you, the nation of Israel, on eagles' wings and brought you to myself, that is, out here into the Sinai Desert. Now therefore, here comes the opportunity. Now therefore, if, and it's positional, it depends on what Israel does. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, this covenant of law that will be coming in the next chapter, if Israel will be obedient to that, then you shall be a peculiar treasure, something of intrinsic value unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. God's sovereign. If he wants to make one nation superseding all the others, that's his prerogative, and that's what he has done. He has made Israel now then above all the other people of the world. Now, verse 6. And you, the nation of Israel, shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Now, those are the two key words. Israel is to be looking forward to a kingdom in which every Jew would be a priest or a go-between between their God and the non-Jewish world. Now, most people miss that, but that was Israel's prospect. That's why, of course, when you start immediately back there in the gospel accounts, what does John the Baptist institute? Well, the water baptism has nothing to do with the church whatsoever. It's a Jewish phenomenon. But what was the reason? To prepare every priestly Jew for his role as priest, but how did every priest begin? Wash, wash. And so it was an indication that they were now a prepared priesthood of people. Not just Levi, the whole nation was to become a kingdom of priests and a holy or set apart nation like Levi was in the nation of Israel. Every Jew was to become like a Levite 
to the nations of the world. All right, now then, if we can come back to Isaiah 61, verse 6 again, this is what the prophet is referring to, that the day will come when every Jew would become a priest of Jehovah. Reading on in verse 6, Men shall call you the what? The ministers of our God. That's the role of every Jew when they come into this glorious kingdom. And you shall be the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast yourselves. Now, has Israel ever been able to do that? Never. Never. My, they were the downtrodden. Their kids were kidnapped and sold for little or nothing. And they've always been the hated and the despised people. But all oh, that's going to turn when they finally have their Messiah ruling and reigning. And in the glory of the Gentiles, the Jew will be able to boast himself. Now, I guess I've been remiss. I haven't been referring to the second timeline, so good old Jerry, and old Jerry is the one that keeps me online. He's done that for the last 14 years, I guess. Every once in a while he'll come up and he'll say, well, Les, you haven't given the gospel lately. <laughs> and so after the last program, he said, well, no, Les, he said, you can't let him hang on that second line without telling him what it's for. All right, good idea. So now then, with all of this prospect given to Israel, that they're going to bring beauty out of the ashes of the destruction of the tribulation, that they're going to be priests of Jehovah when they are the, the favored nation enjoying all of the promises. But as we've been seeing now all afternoon, we know, we know from history, this timeline got interrupted. It didn't keep going. The tribulation didn't come in. And that's what we've been showing by splitting these portions of Scripture, that everything up to a point in his first advent, and then the rest is pushed out into the future. Now, that's the whole purpose, then, of the bottom timeline. This is how it actually unfolded. After Christ ascended, instead of the tribulation breaking out, God does just the opposite. He turns to the whole human race without Israel and opens up the windows of heaven's grace for salvation to the whole human family. All right, now let's just go up into the New Testament and show how that came about because, you see, all the way through the Gospels, as we've been showing all afternoon, God is dealing only with the nation of Israel, no hint of going to the Gentiles, but Israel is rejecting and rejecting and rejecting until finally we get to Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> Acts chapter 7, about seven years after Pentecost. A nation-changing event takes place. And it's the Jew Stephen who was part of that original group of believing Jews comprising the Jerusalem church who now has his day in the sun proclaiming to the nation of Israel, especially the religious leaders, this whole sermon of chapter 7. And he does like the Apostle Paul did on occasion. He goes clear back into Israel's history and revamps it and again reminds them of how God has been with the nation and then how they had been constantly guilty of rejecting everything. All right, Acts chapter 7, verse 51. I'm just recapping now to show how we funnel in to this bottom line and we have to leave the top line go for the time being. All right, Acts chapter 7. Verse 51, and Stephen is addressing the religious rulers of Israel. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit, which they'd done down through their history, as your fathers did, so you do. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them who showed or prophesied the coming of the just one, which is another reference how they 
killed the prophets over and over. They didn't like the message, you know. Of whom now you are the betrayers and murderers by crucifying their Messiah. Verse 53, you who have received the law by the disposition of angels. In other words, it was a supernatural revelation of God's mind for the nation, and you've not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart, and they turned on him, and they stoned Stephen, in verse 58, and they laid their clothes, verse 60, and he kneeled down and cried loud voice, Lord, lay not this in their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. All right, in verse 58. In verse 58, they cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now that's the first inkling you have of this next major player on the stage of biblical history. Saul of Tarsus, who hated everything pertaining to Jesus of Nazareth. All right, now chapter 8, verse 1, Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. In fact, he was leading the persecution. And the Jews, because of Saul, were scattered all around that part of the world except the apostles. All right, now then, you have to understand the Jewish mentality concerning the Gentiles. They detested them. They were filthy morally. They couldn't stand their diet compared to the kosher food of Israel. And so they detested Gentiles. They didn't want a thing to do with them. What, of course, that's what God had taught them all the way up through the, through the centuries. They were to have nothing to do with those unclean Gentiles. And so that was their mindset. Now then, as a result of their rejecting and rejecting and rejecting, God's going to do something totally, totally different. Never hinted at in the Old Testament. Jesus never hinted at it in his earthly ministry. But here, out of the blue, God saves this tormentor of the followers of Jesus in Nazareth. But the best way to point to the very core of the thing is in chapter 9, verse 15. And this is what I call the fork in the road. Israel is going to go down into her dispersion. Her timeline is going to be stopped and pushed out into the future. And on the other end of the fork in the road is God turning to the Gentile world without Israel. Israel is not going to be the go-between. Israel is not going to have the role of priests of Jehovah but it'll be one man. Isaiah, uh, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 15. The Lord said unto him, that is Ananias, this believing Jew there in Damascus, go thy way, for he, Saul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the, what? Gentiles, unheard of. A Jew going to Gentiles, the only other instance was Jonah. And you all know how much Jonah wanted to go to Nineveh. He'd rather drown any day as go to those pagan Gentiles. Now this is the first time again that God has ever said something like that. I want to send you far hence to the Gentile. And that's what you have to understand. And so that's why we can now drop down to a whole new last half of the timeline that God will push all this into the future as we have it down here and open up the gospel of the grace of God for the whole human race out calling men and women, boys and girls who become members then of the body of Christ, which is the true church. Not the church on the corner necessarily, but the true believer who is a member of the body of Christ. All right, now we've come almost 2,000 years, and we maintain that before God can pick up where he left off in all the prophecies and bring in the tribulation, the body of Christ has to be taken out. It will not mix with Israel. It's an impossibility, and anybody that tries to teach the church into the tribulation will not 
look at that aspect that Paul never, never implies that the body of Christ will have anything to do with Israel's prophetic program. We're insulated from it. And so this is the whole idea now then that until the body of Christ is complete and taken out, then the prophetic program will kick back in gear. Then we'll go into the tribulation. We won't, but the world will go into the tribulation. Christ will return and the prophetic program will conclude. All right, now then, that should sufficient, be sufficient for now at least. Let's go back to Isaiah 61 and uh, try to move ahead and hopefully in the next four programs we can finish the book of Isaiah and move on to something new. Okay, Isaiah 61, where we just left off that Israel is to be a nation of priests in verse 6, and they're going to enjoy all of the good things of the Gentile world. Now verse 7, for your shame, in other words, for all of their past unbelief and their disobedience, for your shame you shall have double. In other words, the glory of the kingdom is going to more than compensate for all that Israel has suffered in their unbelief. All right, reading on. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them, that is, the nation of Israel. Verse 8, for I, the Lord, love judgment. Now, remember I explained that word a couple programs back or taping back, that it means a benevolent government, something that is strictly for the good of the people. And that's what the Lord loves. He loves that kind of government. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. All right, now let's look and see what that covenant is going to imply. Jump ahead now to Jeremiah, another portion we've looked at over and over over the years, but let's look at it again. Jeremiah 31, 31. And again, as you read this, remind yourself, this has never happened before. This has never happened to Israel, but it's going to. It's coming. Isaiah, I mean, Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Now, you see, a lot of theologians try to put us under this covenant. No way. This covenant is not for the church age. It is for Israel, and it will come to its fruition when the kingdom becomes a reality. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come. Now, what does that mean? You can believe it. God has said it. It's going to happen. Now, when you look at Israel tonight, you would say, never, never happened. They are so secular. They are so mixed up in their theology, even, even their religious leaders. My, when you read some of the stuff they write, it just doesn't make sense. They've been blinded to all these things. But it's not always going to be that way. The day is coming when they're going to enjoy the outpouring of God's blessings, spiritual as well as material. All right, verse 31 again. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now here's where these replacement theologians have to throw all these things out and say that everything has been given to the church. So then they try to put the church under the covenant promise. Listen, has the church today come to this place spiritually? Have every one of you and I here in this room, have we come to this place? Well, if you have, you're a lot better than I am, because I haven't. But it'll come one day for Israel. And so we're not under this covenant. Now, we enjoy all the things that God has done to make this covenant possible, of course, but we're not a covenant people. All right, now read on. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, it's not going to be a covenant of law and sacrifices and feast days and so forth. It's going to be something far beyond that. 
All right, now verse 33. But this, this is what's coming in Israel's future, spiritually. Now, we've already seen what's coming materially and physically, the glorious earth, the glorious production, the glorious peace and prosperity, and all these things in the wealth, um, in the physical, and in the material. But here's the spiritual. This will just put the whole thing together. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, verse 33. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward part. I will write it in their heart. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. My, what a relationship Israel is finally going to have with their creator, God. All right, now verse 34. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor. Why? Everybody will know all there is to know. They won't have to teach people how to keep the law. They won't have to memorize and be able to understand that certain things are wrong. No, it'll be written in their heart. They will have a relationship with their maker like they have never enjoyed before. All right? Then they will say, reading on in verse 34, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. There won't have to be any evangelism. They won't have to be out trying to win the lost. They will all have that same relationship with their God. All right, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. And remember, Israel has been guilty of a lot of it. And I will remember their sin no more. That's what God said. Israel is finally going to come to the place where God will not have one iota of fault against them. They will be as perfect as a human race can be perfect. All right, now then, verse 35. If these people think that God is all through with Israel, then you see they have to throw these verses away. They have to just totally reject them because here it is. For thus saith the Lord, the Lord who giveth the Creator God, the Lord who giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, the Lord who divides the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is His name. Now here's the promise. If, conditional, if those ordinances depart, in other words, if the sun falls out of its place, if the moon would fall out of its orbit, the stars would simply start coming together in a conflagration, if that would happen, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel would cease from being a nation before me. And these people try to tell us that the Jew disappeared shortly after 70 A.D. Well, the sun still shines. The moon is still in its orbit. Everything is according to his divine plan. Nothing catastrophic has happened. Well, that being the case, then Israel is still a valid entity. And don't you ever be taken in by this stuff because that's all it is. And listen, they're coming in like a flood. I'm reading more and more how that people are falling for this whole idea that God is through with the Jew. There is no such thing as a rapture. There's no tribulation coming. There's no great catastrophic events because after all, God is all through with Israel. But my Bible says no way. No way. All right. Now then, let's go back where we were in Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 9. And their seed, that is their children, their coming generations, and they will be having children. Now you want to remember, when I talk about the kingdom, this is going to be a kingdom of mortal human beings. Men and women, having children, having families, but Israel will be the apple of God's eye. They will be the recipients of all of these promises given to them as a nation of people. So yes, they will be having children and families. Verse 9, And so their seed and their children shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. 
all that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. They're going to be so uniquely blessed that all the Gentile nations that are present in the kingdom will recognize them for who they are. All right, now in verse 10 is a verse that I've used in various ways where Isaiah now writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God for he, God, has clothed me with the garments of salvation. And as a result of those garments of salvation, he hath covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorned. Now what's Isaiah doing? Isaiah is giving a picture of his own spiritual relationship with his creator God that every Jew in the kingdom economy will enjoy. His personal testimony is a picture of Israel's future. Now, I think I've got time. Come back with me quickly to Genesis chapter 3. We have to do this quickly. I'm hoping I don't run out. Genesis chapter 3. <coughs> Here we have Adam and Eve. They've sinned. They've been separated in their fellowship with God. But God takes the step now to restore them back <coughs> to fellowship and, of course, extend their salvation to them. All right, now remember, they're naked. They've been wearing nothing but fig leaves, which God had nothing to do with. So he's going to clothe them in his own way. Verse 21, So unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins. Now that follows. Where would he get the skins? From animals. Did he skin them alive? No, they became sacrificial <laughs> animals. And so here we have the blood sacrifice introduced already with Adam and Eve with that which was provided by God. All right, so the coats of skins clothe their physical nakedness. But here's the key. And along with that, having seen their faith, the blood has now been shed. What does God do with them? He clothes them. And that's not talking about the animal skins. It's talking about his righteousness. And so when Adam and Eve, by virtue of their faith and the blood sacrifice, God clothes them with righteousness. But you know what? He's doing the same thing with us today. Romans 3 says, the moment we believe the gospel, what does God do? God clothes us with His righteousness. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.